spend some time in. We've heard our words, and now let's spend some time hearing the word of the Lord. Is that all right? Let's hear what the word of God will speak to us. Amen. Today. And just imagine. Amen. That God has a word for us. God has a word for you. God has a word for all of us. Acts chapter 8, page 892. We've been in a series on revolutionary living. This whole summer has been our summer series preaching through the book of Acts. And I want to stay here. I found this passage just in the course of what we're talking about to be very relevant. Acts chapter number 8, verse number 26. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the book of Acts? How many of you are a little unfamiliar with the book of Acts? All right. So why don't I just give you a little bit of frame. So the book of Acts is the record of the first generation of disciples that have uh, taken the words of Jesus and have actually lived it out in the context of a worshiping community. The book of Acts is thought to have been written by the same person who wrote the gospel according to Luke. Uh, all y'all familiar with the gospel according to Luke, right? So you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'll tell you the name. I know my Bible. Right? <laughs> so the, the book of Luke. So uh, Acts could be, in many ways, Luke part two. All right? It is a continuation of this same narrative. And in the book of Acts, you find uh, that the disciples had heard all these wonderful things about Jesus. They heard all these things from the mind and the mouth and the life of Jesus. And now Jesus is gone. And they're trying to figure out, what do we do next? And in the book of Acts, you find that they had this radical encounter with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is nothing more than the lived, abiding presence of the Spirit of God. Right? And this Spirit came and it impacted these uh, regular normal folk, just like you and me. So it wasn't like, you know, uh, the apostles and the saints, they weren't saints at the beginning. They were apes, just like you and me. <laughs> amen. Have no fear, amen. Amen. When God put the Spirit in you, take your name, you become a saint. Praise God. It's just that. You get the Spirit, you become a saint. At least in our tradition, I know some of our Catholic traditions is a little more, you know, threshold a little high. <laughs> But we'll, we'll, we'll let the Catholics keep on keeping that high threshold. But in our tradition, when the Spirit gets in your life, you become a powerful vessel in the hand of God. Amen. And the book of Acts then captures the recording of the first acts, the first actions of the disciples. And we are picking up one of these passages of Scripture uh, just to give you a little bit more direct context, uh, Jesus told the disciples to go preach the gospel, go everywhere, and go tell this good news. When the disciples heard that, guess what the disciples did? They all stayed at home. <laughs> just like with some of us. God tells us to go do stuff. Go change your community. Go mentor somebody. Go organize. Go forgive somebody. Let it go. And we like, yes, Lord. When we hear it, and then after you leave the place where you heard it, you just stay at home. So this really is a conversation about us. Tell you, Pastor, I want to chat this. It's a conversation about me. It's not a conversation about these old ancient folk. It's a conversation about me. And 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 persecution came to the city of Jerusalem, where all these disciples and followers of Jesus decided to hang out. And when the persecution came, guess what the disciples did then? They ran. And they started to go and do actually what Jesus told them to do in the first place. And I just want to say that sometimes hardship comes. And that's the only thing that will get some of us to move. Come on. Come on. So as much as I deplore all of the hard things that have to happen in my life. I'm often grateful. 
later on because I realized if it was not hard, I'd still be in that old place <laughs> where God told me to move from when everything was easy. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them hard moves. You know, sometimes it's hard moves. <laughs> so you have this guy named Philip, one of these disciples who was told by Jesus to go and preach the gospel everywhere. And the scripture says, right before this, one of Philip's friends, his name was Stephen, just got killed. And then he, Stephen, Stephen was killed right in front of Philip. And Philip, for fear, began to run. And as Philip ran, he ran into the primary character in this story, an Ethiopian eunuch. I know we got a lot of hop shop folks in here, so I want to like mess up y'all's cultures, pray to God. So, you know, uh, if I do anything incorrect, you run up here and correct it for me, okay? I'm just swear. <laughs> but uh, 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 let's pick up the passage. Let's let the word of God speak to us, and let's see uh, and imagine uh, what uh, kind of hoodie theology may come out of this passage. That's what's going to be our sermon topic today: hoodie theology, part two. Then an angel of the Lord, verse number 26, Acts chapter 8 says, Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Lord, I'm trying to preach with this hot old hoodie on. Get an extra bit of anointing. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, of, I'm sorry, yeah, of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join him. So Philip's walking along his way. He sees this Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot reading out loud the words of scripture. And the spirit that has Philip on the run tells Philip to slow down and go hang out with this Ethiopian. So Philip ran up to the chariot heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he replied, this is what the eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I understand unless someone guides me? I want you to put a little pin on there. because That's going to be something we're going to visit later. And the eunuch invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. I want you to imagine a very deep scripture we've got to read. The eunuch is reading this scripture. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to the water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is preventing me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. Both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Some traditions say that this eunuch brought the gospel back to Ethiopia. And some traditions go on to say that this is probably the longest running Christian church in the history of the world. Just can't people tell you that some perverted, you know, domineering folks started the Christian faith in a lab to oppress all of humanity. <laughs> tell them there was a eunuch <laughs> from Ethiopia that didn't know nothing about King James and none of them folks. And the gospel grabbed a hold of him just like it's grabbing a hold of you. Yes. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, he got a hold of me too. <laughs> so, we're going to spend a few moments in this passage at the title of the sermon, Hoodie Theology. 
This too must be redeemed. This too must be redeemed. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless us as your people. We stand here in your presence and we're seeking a word from you. A word that clarifies, a word that sanctifies, a word that humanizes, a word that heals us. Bless us. Touch my body, hide me behind the cross, send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let us grow by your word. This is our prayer. In your name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give me one more high five and tell them this too must be redeemed. This too must be redeemed. James Cone, he's a theologian from the 1970s and he says that too long American Christianity has been a chaplain for oppression rather than a prophet for justice and restoration. That in many ways, Christian faith has failed to speak to the brokenness of humanity, not because it does not have the ability to do so, but because many of us have failed to really allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to be unleashed. I want to submit to you today that one of the great opportunities that lay before us as we struggle with this reality of our own lives, because certainly while the verdict is deeply tragic and problematic, how many of you can be honest that you had problems before the Zimmerman verdict came down yesterday at 7 o'clock at night? Oh, okay. Well, thank you for the 20 honest folks. <laughs> How many can be honest to say that your world was already a little kind of upside down, sideways, you had some challenges in your family, in your own self, and, and, and we that have been moved by this, this moment and this, this, this trial uh, may in some ways be a little bit of a distraction from the continuous challenges that we all know we have to face. Once everybody goes back to business as usual. Because I'm going to remind you, we had Hoodie Sunday a year ago in March. And folks was out marching and doing all kinds of stuff. And about two weeks later, folks went back to shopping and folks went back to your regular schedule drama. So tell your neighbor, man, your drama is still waiting for you. Your drama, you know, has disappeared just because we focused on the tragedy of Trey Brown. That all of us have some issues that, that we have to live with every single day and the question for many of us must be about how does the Word of God speak to my condition? And what does God have to say about what is next for me? What's next for my community? What's next for my family? What's next for our people? I want you to understand that part of what the book of Acts is so powerfully communicating to all of us is God can take ordinary people and flip the world upside down. All right. Many of us are looking for a savior to come and make your life better. And I believe that God has already sent the savior. And that Savior has given you power yes. to take the worst conditions of your life yes. and turn it into a blessing. Yes. Part of what you must understand, child of God, today is if we abdicate the power that has been given to us and allow someone else to have power and control, when God has given you power, then in some regards, the conditions of our world are not God's to solve, yes. but they're ours. Yes. Right. Now I know a lot of us are waiting for our prince and shining on. We wait for the hero to swoop down and save the day. But tell your neighbor, you are the hero. Amen. Tell that neighbor, you are the shero. You are the one that we've been waiting for. But you cannot do it on your own, child of God. Because how many know left to your own devices, you're going to always mess the thing up. Man, I know it's a little late. Some of y'all are like, Pastor, we ain't never been to church this long. But what you got to understand, child of God, is that God knows how much you can handle and he will never put Weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, in your life, 
It's because God thinks this highly of your strength. All right. And what it means is that you do not understand how strong you are. Hey. Until you tap into the power that God has placed inside of you. Amen. Lord, I don't know why I'm preaching a little bit today. Give right. your neighbor a high five and tell them I got some power inside of me. Now, now, now understand, child of God, that when we take a look at this text, this Ethiopian eunuch, I believe is a wonderful example of who we are as a people. The human race. This Ethiopian eunuch is a very powerful person, has great privilege, has great education, has access to every single amenity he could ever want. But the eunuch is also broken. For to be a eunuch meant that he has been castrated. To be a eunuch meant that in some part of his life, his organs, his sexual organs, his, 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 his body has been mutilated for whatever reason. And I believe that this is a powerful commentary on who we are as a people today. We live in arguably the most wealthiest country in the world. We have access to every amenity we can ever want. But when you peel back all of our privilege, we are broken as a people. There are parts of us that are not whole. Our families are not whole. Our communities are not whole. Our own identities are not whole. Our economics are not whole. Our health, not whole. But we are still powerful people, able to accomplish all these great feats. We can make up stuff, we can create stuff, but it is something that the moment we create things, the brokenness that's inside of us, takes those things that we have created for our good, they are employed in the service of evil. Now I'm gonna bring this down right into your own life because it's like, you know, it's easy to talk about fictitious figures. Yeah. Like, oh, I know that's right, Pastor Mike. <laughs> you speaking the truth. But close your eyes and think about your own brokenness. The brokenness that wouldn't nobody know about unless you disclosed it. Because you can't tell that this Ethiopian is a eunuch unless this eunuch told folk about his condition. And child of God, I want to let you know that the person sitting next to you has a condition you may not ever know about. That's right. And part of what it means for you and I to take the humanity of one another serious is to realize that we are not flat people. We are not people without emotion, without challenges, and without struggle. We are not people that have uh, uh, can claim to be free from prejudice and from the pains of this world. We are not people who can sit in places and not be touched by the difficulties of life. And unless you disclose your condition, we are also people that can hide. And as one of our pastors said in one of our retreats, we can pass. That's right. That's right. We can pass like everything's all right. Some of us can pass more than others. Depending on your race, your class, your money, your fortune, your fame, your name. But how many of you know the truth be told? All of us are broken people. Yeah. And what I love about this story is that the brokenness of the Ethiopian eunuch is actually what drew him to the text. Imagine this that you're reading scripture and of all the words in the scripture you could read, you settle on the part of scripture that speaks the most to your condition. 
surrender uh, the wisdom of, of what needs to happen in your condition to a world that knows nothing about how to speak to the part of you that only God created. God created that special part of you. You were not created by, you know, uh, just some two human beings. But how many of you know that the scriptures tell us that God breathed into us the divine breath of life? And what that means is that breath also reminds you and that we all share the image of God. And if we share the image of God, how many of you know you also share within you the possibility of God to do great things in your life? And child of God, what you and I must never forget, even as we encounter this story, is that God is always looking for an opportunity to connect to your condition. God's looking for an opportunity to speak life to your condition. God is looking for an opportunity for the world
Do you believe? Amen. Hallelujah. Just like that Ethiopian had a broken body. God was still able to use him in spite of his brokenness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That Jesus yes. was wounded yes. for our transgressions. Right. His body was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. But listen, because of the wounds in his body, the stripes in his body, we are
Are you hearing me today? Yes. Yeah. Now, the great thing about our church is we got all kinds of choices for you to help you figure that out. But it don't make no sense for this big area to be in the kind of condition it's in. And we can't find people to volunteer in the schools. We can't find people to walk these neighborhoods at night. The injury we feel from the verdict, let me say this to you. Possibly is a is more compounded because many of us are guilty of doing nothing. All of us have a debt to pay. None of us got here on the strength of our own merit. Someone before you stayed up all night organizing, praying, marching, babysitting, donating. So you and I can sit here today. And we have children in this Bay Area that have no responsible adult anywhere to be found. And you know what? They're not hiding from us. They stand right out there on the corner for all of us to see them. Young sisters walking up and down the street because many of them are homeless. And they're selling their bodies because some perverted man is exploiting them because many of them have nowhere else to go. They're not hiding. Right. 5, 6 a.m., you can go on San Pablo, East 14th Street, and they're walking up and down the street. Right. Tell your neighbor redemption. It don't start with them. Redemption starts with us. And if we as the church, again, I'm a pastor. Before I'm anything else, I'm a pastor. So I can't talk about what the president should do. I can't, I mean, I do talk about what he should do, but I ain't talking about it to you. When I sit down with the president, believe me, they know exactly what I think. Is my phone off? Praise God. <laughs> But they got a little bug on me, praise God. <laughs> the church has to stand up. When the world falls down, the church must stand up. When the world falls down, the church must stand up. 